Hi, my name is Sam and I own $40 million worth of real estate that I bought without using any of my own money. While that's cool, it doesn't really benefit you at all. So in order to make this video worth watching for you, what I've done recently is gone back to the very beginning going over my very first 10 properties that I purchased. It's a unique time where I can go back and see how things went, give you this perspective of a brand new investor, but also the perspective of an experienced investor. So where we are right now is we are on property six, which is my very first apartment complex purchase. It was a small apartment complex, only a nine unit, but I was able to buy without using any of my own money and the problems and the issues and the eventual outcome were not small at all. This little nine unit packs a punch. You will see, trust me, there's some crazy stories, two dead people, lots of stuff that went on on this nine unit. So this is going to be an entertaining and educational video. What I'm going to do now is I'm gonna break down the deal. I'm gonna talk about how I found it, how I funded it, break down the numbers of what I bought it for, what it's worth now, but also talk about some lessons learned from my perspective now. And looking back, what I've learned through more experience and a different lens. So you're gonna be able to get a full scope of a small apartment complex deal, actual case study that I bought six years ago now without using any of my own money and what real estate does over a six year period when you manage it properly because it's freaking powerful. If you are even at least the teeniest bit interested in this topic, please hit that like button. I'd appreciate it. And it would show me that you kind of like these case style videos that go over houses or apartments or even self storage facilities. So hit that like button, I'd appreciate it. As I said earlier, this deal was crazy and this is a perfect example to show some highs and lows of getting into real estate and buying something when you don't know what the heck you're doing because back then, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I never owned an apartment complex, never dealt with the issues that I was getting ready to deal with. And like I said, two people passed away in the building within a couple years after purchasing it. I'll explain more how and why at the end of the video, a little spoiler alert for you. So I got the deal from a local wholesaler, actually, somebody that I'd never bought a property from before. I met them at a local meetup and I've been dealing with wholesalers and been investing for about a year, year and a half at this point and knew to connect with other real estate people in the industry, whether it be wholesalers or agents or contractors. I was starting to make some connections and a local wholesaler actually brought me this deal. And and the cool part is he didn't even get a part of it. He just heard that this seller was looking to sell. So he just handed me off to them and left. He's like, I don't need any piece of this. I don't deal with apartment complexes. If you want it, great. If not, no big deal. So that was kind of a cool outcome from a relationship that I had just been developing for a couple months. It goes to show the power of developing relationships. I'd never even done a deal with this guy. Since then, we've done several deals, but at this point, he just handed me off a lead that was kind of out of his realm and it turned into an amazing property. But that does not go without some hiccups and speed bumps and Whatever's bigger than a speed bump is what we hit on this one. All right, let's talk about the deal, how we funded it, go over some initial numbers. Then we're gonna talk about lessons learned before I wrap a bow on it, go over the final numbers and how everything kind of worked out in the long run, as well as, unfortunately, tell you how those two people passed away. So we ended up buying the property for 255,000. So we bought a nine unit apartment complex in a decent area of town. I wouldn't say bad, wouldn't say good. It's on the outskirts of a really, really good area, but we bought it for 255 grand. Now take into account that this was 2016. So this was before the market really started booming. It was still recovering from the 08 to 2012, 13 dip. Not a lot of people know the kind of the bottom of the dip before things really started to rebound, especially in the investing space was that 2012, 13 timeframe. So we were just a couple years out from that real estate investing hadn't become like a national thing that everybody and their brother and their mother and their sister and their grandparents were getting into like they are now. So we got offered this property. We went and looked at it and, and the owner wouldn't budge from his 255. He said, take it or leave it. We tried to negotiate. Didn't really work, but looking at the numbers and our excitement to just get our feet wet in the apartment complex game was enough that we just gave him a full price offer. So we bought it for that 255,000, but we didn't use any of our own money. We used a combination of a private lender who we had used on our first five deals and a small local bank who we had a few rentals with at the time. The small local bank that we were working with was requiring a 25% down payment and 25% of 255,000 is 64 grand. So they said, we'll do the other 75% or 191,000 as a loan, as a mortgage, but you need to come up with 64,000 or 25% on your end. 
I did not have the money at the time. So I went to my private lender who I'd done a flip with and a few rentals with and asked him if he was willing to do a little bit longer term of an investment. That's the beautiful thing about growing relationships with private lenders is they're flexible on terms, but also on types of investments. When you do a flip with a private lender, you borrow money, to buy it and fix it up, then you pay them back as soon as it sells plus interest. And if you borrow money on a rental property, a single family rental, you're borrowing money to buy it and fix it up. And then when you refinance it on a new loan, you pay them back with that money. So those are usually three, four, five, six month deals. But on an apartment complex, how I structured this one was he gave me the money for the down payment and then I paid him monthly on that. And then after three years, ended up paying him his full amount back. Don't worry, I'm gonna go over all the numbers and simply break it down and things will be flashing all over here and show you exactly how it worked. It's actually pretty simple. So to recap that, 25% came from a private lender at 64,000. The bank did the other 75% or 191,000. So we got the deal funded, it closed, and now I owned a nine unit apartment complex and didn't know what the f I was doing. Obviously it all worked out because I still own it today, but let's talk about the path that I took to get to where I refinanced it in 2019 and paid him back and to where I am today. In order to get the 25% down from the private lender, we had to make him 25% owner of the LLC that owned the property. So in essence, he owned 25% of this multifamily and me and my partner Lucas own the other 75%. While that sounds simple, it had a few obstacles and some lessons learned there. Having a private lender be more than 20% owner is not ideal because if somebody is 20% or more ownership, they have to be on the documentation. They're kind of legally on the line. If you can structure your deals with one or multiple private lenders all owning less than 20%, that's the best way to do it. They don't have to sign on anything and they're not liable for anything. So not knowing that, we got through this deal, the private lender, again, fortunately, it was somebody that we had to delivered in the past on deals and that had confidence in us and real estate, he was okay with kind of putting his butt on the line for a couple of years, but it's not ideal. So keeping them, if you're giving away ownership, which you don't have to do and we don't really do anymore, but if you're giving away ownership, keep it below that 20%. So that was not the end of the world, but a lesson learned on this deal we gave him a little bit too much equity because we were trying to mirror it to how much you put down. Some other lessons learned, which are basically just the pros and cons of owning multifamily, but I wanna specifically break them down with this deal as an example. One bad apple can kind of ruin a complex. When you're dealing with single families, you have one tenant here, one tenant here, one tenant miles away. They don't all interact. And if you have a bad tenant, you can kick them out and they're only affecting the other houses around them that you probably don't own. But with an apartment complex, somebody that's a bad apple that doesn't pay or that trash talks you or that leaves the property in horrible condition or leaves the hallways muddy or drags mud throughout it, that can affect the entire building. It shows people that, hey, if he can do it, I can do it. So then other people start to mistreat the property. It also makes people not want to stay there and up their lease. And even worse, it makes new people not want to stay there. So one bad apple in an apartment complex, any apartment complex can really have an effect. So you have to be very, very careful about owning that complex because you're owning a community of people and you want everybody to get along and to respect you and you respect them. So we had a few bad apples at that property that we ended up getting out. One of them passed away, I'll tell you about in a minute, but we had some other bad apples that we just unfortunately had to get out or they left on their own as we threatened to evict them. So lesson learned, make sure you're doing a really, really good job to screen tenants. Just in general, make sure you're developing a positive community when you're buying apartment complexes. Another con of owning any apartment complex, but specifically one like this, is the tenant base is usually not as reliable as a single family tenant base. So this apartment complex was a little bit north of a small city. Houses in the city rent for 1,200, 1,300, 1,400. But the rent for this apartment complex at the time we bought it was like 600 or $700. So somebody that can afford $1,400 rent is usually a little more reliable. They're usually a little more financially responsible as opposed to somebody that can maybe only afford that six or $700 a month. So in general, I've noticed that in my portfolio that our apartment complexes tenant base usually turn over a little bit more. And while we have amazing tenants in our apartments, they're not always as reliable as our single family tenants. Those are usually families with a little more responsible and they want to take care of it and make that house a home for them to live in as opposed to apartments it's usually more of a short-term deal. People are in and out and they don't 
honestly respect the property as much. But there are a ton of pros in owning apartment complexes and this property is a perfect example of that. As you'll see when I show you the real numbers here in a minute, but when you own apartment complexes, you can control the value of that asset. My houses, I can't really control them, assuming that I manage my rental properties, houses, and my apartments. Similarly, I take care of them and deal with the upkeep. I can't control the values of my houses. If the market dips 10% next year, my houses dip 10%. But if the housing market dips 10% next year, my multifamilies should not be affected at all because multifamilies value is based on the income it produces. So as long as I'm collecting rent and managing the property properly, it will go up in value over time. So I control the value of my multifamily assets as opposed to the market controlling the value of my single family assets. Also, you can scale a lot faster. It would have taken me a long time to buy nine houses, especially back then when I didn't have my systems and financing all set up. It would have taken me probably three or four years to buy nine separate houses, let alone cost me five or six times as much. But when you buy multifamilies, you scale quickly because you're buying several units at one time. So I was able to buy nine in one swipe as opposed to buying one at a time over however long it was gonna take me to buy nine. All right, let's break down the numbers so I can show you how I was able to make that $100,000 of tax-free money and pay everybody back. And then we'll end it on a sad, weird, odd note and I'll tell you how the two people passed away. So I bought the property in 2016, like I mentioned, but in 2019, I did a cash out refinance and took out a new loan so I could pay back my private lender their money plus interest and buy them out of that 25% ownership in the property. Over the three years prior to this refinance, so from 2016 to 2019, we were able to add a lot of value and increase the net income because net income is how you value your apartment complexes and multifamily properties. So we increased the rent slightly throughout the years on the nine units. We we're able to cut expenses by getting efficient with our in-house property management team and also by utilizing technology. So we were able to create more income and lower the overhead, which then in turn increased the net income a lot and that increased the value. So in 2019, we got the property reappraised and it appraised for $450,000. So not quite doubling in value in just three years. So the bank gave us a new loan for 80% of $450,000. So they gave us a new loan for three hundred sixty dollars However, we didn't get to keep all that. We had to pay things back and pay other people back. So the first thing we did with that $360,000 cash out refinance check was, well, the bank did this part in the title company. We had to pay off our old loan, which was 191, but it was paid down to 175. So off the top, 360 minus 175,000, which was the original loan. Then we borrowed $64,000 from our private lender. We wanted to pay him off and get him off the deal. So we gave him his 64,000. So that had to come off the top. And then we paid him his 25% of cash flow as he owned the property, but we had to pay him an additional interest on top of that when we bought him out to get him to that 12, 13% overall return. So we gave him a, an additional check for 21,000. So he gave us 64,000. He got a little bit of cash flow over the three years, and then we gave him a check back three years later for 85,000. So you do the math, 360 minus 175 minus 64 minus 21 is, exactly $100,000. So after everybody was paid off, we had $100,000 sitting in our bank account and it wasn't taxed. It was tax free because it's debt. I could have left that money in the deal and had a lower mortgage payment, but we were able to have a lower mortgage payment than we had the previous three years because we got much better terms on this refinance. We got a lower interest rate. It was amortized over 30 years. So our monthly payment went down and we were able to collect that $100,000 of tax-free money because it's debt and debt is not taxed. So that's a beautiful thing that we didn't really take into account when we were doing this deal, that if you're able to create massive equity quickly with multifamily properties and volume of scale, that's also creating equity that you can pull out this tax free. And we've taken that $100,000 and we put it in a reserve account. We pay some property taxes. We paid off a rental property. So we were just able to utilize that $100,000 in a lot of ways that made more sense than leaving it in the deal. Before I tell you how the people unfortunately passed away, make sure to hit the subscribe button if you saw any value out of this video. All right, so we had been owning the property for about six months and we got a call from the police and they said that someone had passed away and my heart sunk. I was like, oh no, like one of our tenants, you know, they, they were a little bit rougher tenants. This area was 
not horrible, but not great. There was known to be drugs in the area. We were trying to improve the community by making this place nicer. But I liked our tenants still, even though some of them were obviously druggies. This person's friend had passed away in the property, so it wasn't really the actual tenant. It was their friend had overdosed on the property, which in turn scared the tenant that we were gonna have to evict away anyway. So that kind of took care of itself. Unfortunately, that happened. The other one is a little bit more interesting. So we had somebody that we inherited when we bought the property. He paid his rent on time, but he was not easy to deal with. He was on oxygen 24 seven, but still smoked cigarettes 24 seven. So that's kind of counteractive. But anyways, he was a little bit of a pain to deal with and he decided that he didn't really wanna be around anymore. So he actually overdosed on some of his medicine as well. I think one was accidental, one was on purpose. Regardless, it was a big kick in the face for us that we wanna get these types of activities away from our properties and we wanna make this building and every property that we own a nice safe place for our tenant. And since then we have, we have had not had any issues since then with our 275 rental properties. So this was kind of showing us one way to do it, the slumlord that owned it before us, but we went a complete opposite direction since then, and we never really were slumlords, but we make our properties nice and get great, amazing tenants in there. Hopefully you found that interesting. If you did, check out this series over here, which is the 10 first properties that I bought. We're on video six, so check out the other five over here, and if you're watching this later, the other four as well. See you on the next one.